so, so interesting enough, I, I presented to the, the, the council in Rocky View County, and they were quite interested in the ecosystem service approach uh, because for them, I think they were, to be honest, their interest was from more of a restoration perspective. So could they get some of the restoration dollars when, when a wetland gets destroyed and there's a compensation check? Could that go to actually restoring wetlands back in Rocky View County where they could be getting some of these you know, ecosystem services or developing for it? So, so that there is some interest, but it's probably the opposite way that you were interested, you're, you're, you're looking for. One of the things that, that interests me or that, that I've, I've found is what, is it clear what the issue is? So yes, there's development tax dollars, uh, but what's the other side of it? So is it clear for, there's a water quality issue? Is, is there, are there a group of people that understand that there's an issue? Because if, if, otherwise, if you're gonna be a lone drummer beating a drum, uh, it's gonna be really difficult. But if there's, a, if there's any kind of way of demonstrating, here are the economic values you get from development, but here are the things that might might lose, like we might change or modify or lose. And it doesn't always have to be data. You don't have to do a scientific study about exactly what's gonna change in the phosphorus and whatever. If you can have a dialogue that shows the change, the chain of changes, sometimes bringing that up is enough to have a discussion to say, wait a minute, what are the unintended consequences? Because it sounds like right now, the county sees the dollar figures and the tax dollar revenue, but none of the unintended consequences. And so unfortunately, you have to have a willing, it has to be a willing discussion about it, but it sounds like the unintended consequences aren't clear, and that might be an area where you want to focus. At least that's what we do. But, but again, it's, you have to have those willing audiences, right? So you've got to find something that the council will find important, and if it's an increase in water quality costs from, from changes in wetland use, that might be part of it. Whenever you're making a decision, it doesn't matter what decision, on policy or budget, can you ask yourself, what, what is the expected well-being impact of anything we do? How will that affect, in my wildest dreams, if we had a balance sheet, we could actually go to that balance sheet and answer that question. Uh, there has to be a commitment, I think, to full cost accounting. But if that, that question with the well-being impact is in play, it leads us down that path of a conversation about what matters. And, and I think, even without the valuation on it, I think we have, we have the capacity to figure these things out, make up, make the trade-offs, and at the end of the, and go to sleep at night saying, you know, we, we did, we did the best in terms of discerning what what those impacts are going to be. But I know, in, in, you know, governments they don't they don't budget based on a well-being bottom line. So we got to, you know, we got to come a little ways here. I just have a, one other thing to add to that, and it's um, once it gets down to a, a planner's decision. Um, uh, Julian referred to it already, like uh, planners go through this mitigation hierarchy, so can the developer avoid, and, um, but usually there's not any basis to prevent a development, and there usually uh, must be some higher guidance given to planners to determine whether they should force a development uh, to not go ahead. And, and there's a whole bunch of legal issues that would be uh, challenging the planners in municipalities, including have you treated all developers fairly? So there's all sorts of things um, that, that we'd have to worry about, and I think that's why this happens so frequently. If there could be you know, a review of the proposal and trying to strike up a dialogue with them about how to incorporate some of these externalities, even if the project does go ahead, perhaps in how they actually do the development or maintain it in the long run, you could actually influence that. Thank you for that question. It's something I taught for 10 years uh, at the U of A, um, and and to me, it's just it's all about you know it's all about reputation. Uh, if I looked at the one thing that we look at is you know we call it the the good company. What what could a good company look like? Um, I worked on the GRI guidelines years ago, the first guidelines, and that was a good attempt at defining what a good sustainable enterprise might look like. But if I look at metrics like you know, the best places to work in Canada or Bloomberg's environmental performance uh, data set. And I put that all together. I would have to, uh, and I look at Corporate Knights Awards uh, this year for best companies, MEC, tech, tech number two. What? How could tech make number two? Well, because they obviously achieve some 
level of performance that I think is there a comparative advantage vis-a-vis -vis other resource companies. And so I would look as a measurement guy, what are the characteristics of tech and their internal behavior that is clearly giving them a, um, a you know, there is no, there is no renewal of license to operate based on that performance, right? Because corporations, I always explain to my business students, if you look at the legal documents of corporations, in one of the sections of the doc, legal document called best interest, nothing is defined in that section. The lawyers will say, don't even put fiduciary responsibility in there. So there is no compelling reason to be a, a good company. But good companies uh, know that brand and reputation and lifetime customer value is worth gold, and that should be on the balance sheet. So these, these issues of socialized operator are, are difficult. I would, for, but I look at behavior, look at tech resources, what they did with the Tunaha Nation in the Cranbrook area, with the with town of Invermere, with Nature Conservancy and the Columbia Basin Trust. They established a relationship to set aside some of those lands for, for ecological values in harmony with still getting the mining options. So again, we, we just look at, I think, areas of behavior. And we want to point to those companies and say, you know, the Unilevers and even the Walmarts are, I would say, leading by good example. And um, I'm hearing a lot of companies talk about shared value, which is a whole other conference if you wanted to talk about that. Um, but really, uh, in my mind, in the conversations that I'm having, companies are looking at social license to operate is what is the potential limiting factors for them to make money, whether that's growth, it's new projects, et cetera. Um, I could say a company like, um, you know, a, a Plains Midstream lost their license to operate when Section 22 was issued last year. They actually had restrictions and limitations on their throughput in their pipelines, and they actually had to do quite a bit in terms of uh, investments in people and management systems and complete change to the way that they run their business from what I've, you know, from what I've heard. And, and they, it, it's taken that level of investment for them to win it back. And so it's really about what you're trying to achieve and what could be limiting. Uh, and what you actually have to do to put in place to get stakeholder approval of how you operate your business. It's difficult to, to measure, um, and like anything, it's you can pick any metric to measure anything, really. I have a, a different take on social license, which is uh, some of the interesting ways that it motivates behavior. And uh, usually, uh, you know, companies aren't always in it for their brand, but they're in it for the sector. If the oil sands get shut down, it's Shell, it's everybody. It's not, and it's going to be because of the aggregate bad acting and not just one company. And so what it, that has led to is actually enormous pressure on government to change some of its policies and force regulated policies on the whole sector instead of just uh, companies going ahead and doing things on a voluntary basis. Because even if they do voluntarily make investments, if everybody else doesn't follow suit or they free ride off them, there's a big risk that they're all going to go down. And I think companies now are very conscious of that and avoiding that risk. because I think um, in some cases we don't know what we don't know and we need to actually get in and roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty and I think about uh, you know Puma's environmental P&L statement as a first attempt I'd love to be able to work with a company in the oil and gas sector and, and figure out what that might look like if we were actually going to release it I think uh, E&I last year released their first integrated report which is really where reporting is going it's actually a holistic look um, along multiple capitals of your business. Uh, but E&I e is one of the few oil and gas companies that have done it, although there's a few mining companies. So I would be really encouraged as the next step if, if there were companies or a company with a consortium of people to come together to figure out what, what that P&L statement for an oil and gas company might look like. I have found really fascinating working with some of our GIS people internally is these little apps, right? So from an ecosystem services or from a monitoring or whatever, bird counts, there are ways of monitoring, having citizens out, collecting, understanding, knowing things that can be uploaded somewhere into a cloud or something. Uh, again, not my area of expertise, but really it's beyond the individual holding things now. And I think that the 1.0, uh, whatever our Apple, I think it needs to be in the citizen's domain because when I come up with things or we develop things, they want to know, can, if, I, if I as a minister or as a deputy minister go out in public, and I say this, where is the evidence that's going to back me up when I say something controversially? I'm like, well, 
we're not always going to have that, but we know the trajectory. So I think it's the 1.0 has to be, don't leave it with government. I just want to say I, I have the original iPhone that I cracked. Uh, I bought it in Seattle and I still have it. And I think it's outrageous that we have i6 now because the i1 was sufficient with enough little, I can add a thermometer to it and do you know ambient air monitoring with the right app and the right, right upgrade. It's outrageous. And, and I'm saying nothing has changed in the accounting world for 500 years. We're still 1.0. What we haven't done is acted on the very basics of accounting principles, which the Sumerians actually taught us a long time before the Italians got wise to accounting in Venice. So there's nothing new under the sun. In fact, I would argue that most of what we're doing here is we're making stuff up. We're throwing numbers around other year. We're transferring values from Costanza to this and that. And it's just outrageous. And we're not, you know, we, so we believe, we believe in these numbers, we believe in GDP, and I, and I, at the end of the day, I say, we don't know anything, we are so clueless, and the best we can do is sit around in a circle and have a good conversation and talk about what we want for our grandchildren and, and be pragmatic. And uh, the numbers aren't gonna help us necessarily. They will guide us, I mean, I love doing spreadsheets, but you know, at the end of the day, my wife said, you either buy the espresso machine and love it or shut up about the spreadsheet, you know? <laughs> Okay, I'm going to answer that because that's actually something that I'm really interested in, uh, how you could bring ways to value the future scarcities into a conservation exchange. So, um, yeah, I don't think we need to worry about like counting the feathers on the budgie birds, but I do think we need to have our eye on what the future scarcities are. And um, if we start pricing wetland loss or uh, habitat loss, in terms of the, the current state of the world, and we know that there is way more development coming, we're not valuing that change in terms of the future risk when we're gonna run into the constraints. And that's actually what cumulative effects is all about. So we have thresholds, we have you know, an endpoint, we can see where we wanna go, but we can't, aren't actually figuring out how these little changes are getting there and then making everybody pay. So what's going to happen is we're going to run up to our threshold and then we're going to shut down industry or else we're just going to go over where we want to be and that's no good. So we, we can do it in lots of other markets. There's a lot, uh, you know, we can uh, sell grain on a futures market. We can sell all sorts of things on options contracts. I do not know why we cannot do this with ecosystems. Um, so one of the things I think the discussion needs to happen is what is the baseline duty of care? What, 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 is, what is it we expect? And not just for baseline for now, but what do we expect in the future? So the Audubon Society released a report at 5.30 this morning while I was driving in dry Edmonton to my bus about the fact that given what's going on, half of the birds in North America are in massive trouble. There's a technical word, but again, that's not my area of expertise. I'm an economist by training. Um, but that's scary, right? Like that is really scary. But how do we actually, how do you drive that into something that people care about and what is our baseline duty of care and that's a scary thing I think from a government perspective because it means that we have to tell landowners and we have to set up what what is expected and we haven't done that a lot over time but I think that's another discussion that not, needs to happen in the Alberta citizen domain to actually get to from an equity perspective in the future, from this whole intergenerational piece, we haven't figured out even in real time what, what that is. So we, and t until we actually have those discussions about now, how are we gonna have those intergenerational equity discussions? And I think it's fascinating. I think Alberta is the perfect place because we're, yeah. we're, we're going hard on development, right? So I, I think, yeah, I'm gonna stop. So this is a teachable moment. Uh, any, anyone who took finance knows that net present value is calculated on discounting the future. But did you know, in the dark ages when they were building cathedrals that took 200 years over maybe four generations of stonemasons, they used negative interest rates in their net present value. What does that mean? It means you build cathedrals that take 200 years, you value the future, and you spend the time, right? At First Nations teach us that, you know, they did potlatch, they had the wampum belt, which represented their all the material wealth. They didn't discount the future, right? So we're using tools that are causing us to make decisions 
right, that are literally discounting the future and the value of these things as significant to human well-being. So, you know, again, we need to go back and, and look at the tools and the assumptions we're working with. And um, I love First Nations for that reason because they remind us that, you know, in their culture, it was about abundance and potlatching and gifting and sharing and sitting in circle. And they didn't consider being on the land work. It was life. And we, we don't even know what money is. So I'm going to leave you with that. You think about what money is. Thank you.